Ancient Babylon's contributions to mathematics, astronomy, music, and architecture are widely acknowledged as a rich legacy. However, when it comes to their advancements in medicine, their achievements appear relatively limited. According to Herodotus, Babylon had no formal medical profession, and individuals seeking medical aid were left in the city square, hoping someone with a similar ailment would assist them. Modern research refutes this claim, though, suggesting it was likely a jest made by a temple's exorcist rather than an accurate portrayal of Babylonian medicine. Until the end of the 19th century, knowledge about Babylon was primarily derived from biblical legends that portrayed it in a negative light. Starting from the name Babylon itself, that in the Bible was translated as confusion, but in fact meant the gate of the gods. However, the discovery of tens of thousands of clay tablets in libraries unveiled the true history of Babylon, providing insights into various aspects, including ancient Babylonian medicine. Assurbanipal, the king of Assyria, demonstrated his support for the sciences by amassing a remarkable collection of cuneiform tablets in his library. He did not claim authorship of this knowledge for himself or his people, but rather recognized its ancient origins, particularly in the field of medicine, which held significance even during his reign. The analysis of medical tablets revealed the existence of hundreds of prepared medicines, numerous prescriptions for various diseases, and detailed catalogs of plants and minerals used in medicine. Despite this wealth of information, the exact process of creating such an extensive and readily available database remains a mystery. In Babylon, there is a lack of tangible evidence regarding the accumulation of medical information, as well as the trial and error process. It's not so easy to see trial and error because what we have are the results. We get the end products. We don't have the intermediate steps. We're right. So we have the recipes. And they'll say, this recipe works. This recipe is tried. This is a, it's a tested recipe. They'll often say this. But we don't know what kind of tests and we don't know what kind of trials. It seems as though knowledge emerged abruptly, fully formed and readily available. Medical knowledge in ancient Babylon was primarily confined to priests and kept as practitioner secrets inaccessible to the general population. Much of this knowledge might be transmitted orally from teacher to student and relied heavily on personal interaction rather than written records. However, the origins of this knowledge remain unclear. Is it possible that experiments were conducted despite the limited evidence? But every once in a while we do get a little bit of a hint, so we'll have sometimes in a letter from the, in the royal court where there'll be a doctor's present treating the royal family royal family was always ill. <laughs> and uh, they'll say, well, uh, here's a medicine, let's try it out first on a slave, see what happens. Then we'll try to give it to the king's son. So there, we know that there was trial and error, but we don't, it's not always, it's not easy to document. An important aspect to consider is that experiments were indeed conducted to verify the effectiveness of the ready-made medicinal recipes in ancient Babylon. However, these experiments were not aimed at developing new drugs or treatments. Instead, it seems like doctors relied on pre-existing prescriptions from their predecessors rather than creating their own. But here is the problem. According to what the Babylonians wrote themselves, these recipes go way back to antediluvian times, a period that many historians describe as full of magic and not so much knowledge. It's kind of puzzling where they got all this wisdom from, considering the context of that time. Part of the problem is that for a long, long time, modern historians of medicine have treated Babylonian medicine as essentially magic. They said it's just, it's really just magic. It's not really serious medicine. So they never wanted to include Babylonian medicine within the history of ancient medicine. Babylonian medicine is commonly regarded as the successor to Sumerian medicine. Sumer, an early Mesopotamian civilization, played a significant role in influencing Babylonian medical practices, and their medicinal texts were widely utilized. By that time, the Sumerian language had fallen out of common use, 
and was primarily preserved through therapeutic and ritual texts, similar to how Latin is preserved today. In the ancient city of Nippur, a tablet dating back to around 2200 BC was discovered, featuring Sumerian cuneiform. This tablet contained detailed instructions of the preparation of remedies using various ingredients. Initially, it was thought that these texts contained magic spells for dealing with demons. However, linguist Samuel Kramer's discovery in 1955 revealed that the oldest known medical text contained no mention of magic, demons, or gods. But when that's because the texts were not well understood, and the early texts weren't properly published. So the historians of medicine who don't know these languages weren't really able to get an accurate assessment. So from their point of view, they thought, well, this, there's really no distinction, and these medical recipes could have been understood as magic, which is essentially incorrect. Now, the question arises, can we truly be certain that other tablets, traditionally labeled as magical, have been accurately translated? While it is true that medicine and magic were closely intertwined in ancient Babylon, it is essential to recognize a significant distinction between the two. But before that, it's worth making a small remark about ancient magic. We still put in this term a meaning that did not exist in Babylon, not to mention the fact that they did not use the term magic as such. In contrast to the priest, the magician viewed the surrounding reality as a realm governed by autonomous processes that could be influenced. Indeed, the ancient magician did engage with demons and spirits. But in their perception, these entities symbolized specific processes with tangible manifestations. The magician believed that they could actively influence and alter these processes according to their will. Now, this difference is fundamental when compared to religion which tends to be passive, merely offering supplication and seeking mercy from higher beings without attempting to effect change. Consequently, the ancient magician exhibited a more rational approach than the priest, actively striving to combat diseases through their methods and techniques. In a sense, the Babylonian magician functioned akin to a psychotherapist when it comes to their approach. In Babylonian medicine, there was no strict division between ailments of the body and those of the soul, intertwining both aspects seamlessly. What's very different about Babylonian medicine, which is a big surprise to us, is that the person who comes to the patient's house, there were no hospitals, huh? so you can treat someone at home. The person who comes to the patient's home to make the diagnosis, to look at the patient, look at his body, and to examine him, is not the doctor. It's the exorcist who comes. Now that's very important and very interesting because the exorcist is not only concerned about the person's body, but also about the person's state of mind. Magical incantations are often devoted to dealing with anxiety, to fear, to person's fear, uh, for, for fear of the unknown, fear of demons, fear of uh, the gods. This is really what magic often it tries to, tries to deal with and tries to treat. So, although there's no clear distinction between psychological illnesses, we don't have a word for mental illness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's clear that mental, that the idea that, that, the, that the mind could be, or the heart in God could be ill, was, was very much part of medical thinking in the ancient world. But they didn't divide things up so neatly. They didn't, there wasn't a psychiatrist and there wasn't a, a, a physician she went to. It was really more uh, all, all, all together and uh, just in the same way that they used medical recipes and magical incantations together. The idea was if the person felt he was getting better, maybe this might help him get better. From this perspective, the magical rituals performed by exorcists had a beneficial psychological impact on the patient, offering them spiritual solace. Subsequently, the treatment of the body was carried out using medications. It's worth noting that ancient Babylon doctors are often mistakenly conflated into a single image of a magician or spellcaster. However, this perception is far from the truth. If medicine and magic were truly synonymous in ancient Babylon, as commonly believed, 
one might wonder why there were distinct groups of practitioners that seemingly duplicated each other for countless generations. So, who were the representatives of medicine in ancient Babylon? To this day, two primary types of specialists have been identified. The Ashu, who can be considered as therapists and practitioners, bearing resemblance to modern doctors, and the Mashmashu, or Ashipu, who were exorcists, spellcasters, and magicians. Ashu and Mashmashu were distinct from each other in terms of their knowledge and treatment methods, showcasing notable differences in their approach to healing. Moreover, they were associated with different social groups. Ashu therapists were secular doctors who operated independently, often practicing from their own residences. In contrast, Mashmashu exorcists were part of the temple elite and received compensation from the temples for their services. These disparities highlight that they were specialized practitioners with unique approaches to treatment. The differences were quite significant in other details, for example, in the general shape of the tablets. The recipes were written on a vertically oriented tablet in the usual book format, and the tablets with spells were in the landscape version. So they're very complementary and they don't really look alike. If you see a medical tablet and a magical tablet for you, for someone who's used to looking at these things, they look really different. The layout is different, appearance, etc. So these were really quite, quite separate literary genres. Now, contrary to what many believe, the ancient Babylonians never actually put forth a clear theory in any of their writings that demons, evil gods, or cursed food were the exclusive causes of diseases. It's surprising to note that there isn't a cohesive explanation in any Babylonian treatises that links these supernatural factors as the definitive reasons behind illnesses. We are now busy trying to reconstruct theory of healing in, in Mesopotamia. And it's a complicated question because uh, we have, on one hand, we have medical recipes which are very practical. Here's a problem, here's an illness, we're trying to treat it on a very basic level. On the other hand, we have a, and this, these recipes extend over a very long period, uh, 2,000 years we have evidence, even more. On the other hand, we also have an extensive literature on ancient magic. And the ancient magic is really where we find theory. It's why, where disease comes from. There was a very well-developed and complicated magical religious system which tried to address these questions. On the other hand, there were the doctors dealing with his drugs and plants and minerals, trying to deal with the symptoms. But it's over the course of time, what we find is we find a pattern that the, that the religious aspects of medicine become less and less as it becomes, as medicine becomes more and more technical and probably improves. The religious questions were put for the doctor once were less and less important. He was really interested in the techniques of healing, huh? not so much in, in these larger theories. And then you begin to think, well, is there a theory of healing of why these plants work, why these drugs work? Is there some kind of overall theory of how medicine functions? There probably was, but we haven't discovered it yet. We're working on that. The Babylonian concept of demons, seen as invisible carriers of diseases, shares a certain resemblance to the modern understanding of viruses and bacteria both being perceived as external factors. In this regard, Babylonian medicine is just as rational as the notion put forth by Greek philosophers regarding internal imbalances within the body leading to illnesses. Furthermore, in addition to their theoretical understanding, ancient Babylonians had well-developed practical methods of treatment. First and foremost, we encounter extensive medical prescriptions and detailed lists of pharmacological ingredients in their medicine. In certain records of these recipes, there were specific references stating that they had been tested, examined, and passed down from the esteemed sages of the antediluvian era. Interestingly, the term antediluvian in this context did not imply primitiveness or ineffectiveness, 
On the contrary, this source was highly regarded as authoritative and held in high esteem. The primitive label may mislead, as ancient Babylonian medicine wasn't solely reliant on simple one-to-one -one plant remedies for specific diseases. They also crafted composite recipes, combining numerous components, some with over 90 elements, many yet to be fully explored. This indicates that the Babylonian medicine went beyond mere placebo effects and they understood the significance of each component utilized in their treatments. Take, for instance, the case of the ancient Babylonian Ashu therapist Balum Balati, who emphasized in his letter, When I prescribed a bandage for him, the Asu plant was missing, and my lord knows that if even one herb is missing, he will not get better. This shows that composite recipes weren't haphazard blends of various herbs. Rather, doctors recognized the vital role each ingredient played in the efficacy of their treatments. Research becomes even more complex due to the lack of knowledge about the specific dosages of individual components in Babylonian recipes. Dosage is a crucial element in any medicine. This poses a significant challenge for future researchers, as ancient recipes often do not provide explicit dosage instructions, and in cases where they do, it is often expressed in a symbolic manner. This lack of dosage information appears rather peculiar. It suggests that the precise dosages may have been deliberately kept as a secret, passed down orally from one practitioner to another. Moreover, it's fascinating to explore how the patients actually took these medicines. There existed an incredibly vast array of drug forms and preparations, including pills, ointments, powders, tampons, bandages, and more. The diversity extended not only to the forms of drugs, but also encompassed the various methods of their preparation and application. In Babylonian medicine, specific components were carefully chosen for each disease, ensuring their appropriateness and suitability. For instance, in formulations for rectal ailments, an increased amount of oil was incorporated, while kidney-related conditions saw a higher utilization of mineral components. Similarly, eye diseases necessitated a greater emphasis on ointments. Now, if it were all merely placebo, why did they employ such an astonishing array of release forms? Why did they develop a multitude of recipes if all pills were considered identical? Why go through the effort of rewriting and preserving this knowledge? Such practices contradict the notion of it being purely for the sake of pacifying patients. One can also find that the disappearance of Ashu therapists in Babylon aligns with the trajectory of subsequent decline of its medicine. Hence, their effectiveness over generations is evident, as they wouldn't have withstood the test of time otherwise. The accompanying technical instructions for the preparation of plant and mineral materials for cures are particularly interesting. Ashu possessed a rich arsenal of techniques for processing the compounds of drugs. Along with lists of plants and minerals, this is an equally important part of medical knowledge. After all, it's not enough to prepare all the components. You need to know how to turn them into medicine correctly. From cuneiform tablets, we have knowledge of specific lists of instructions for preparing each component. Here are just a few excerpts from the actions listed for a doctor preparing a medicine. After gathering all the constituent elements, they were weighed, washed, immersed, dried, desiccated, roasted, burned, crushed, pounded, pulverized, formed into cubes, grated, sifted, diced, and so on and so on and so on. Each of these actions was accompanied by an extensive and diverse medical technical vocabulary and we can see that there were no standardized methods of preparing medicines. Different preparations were made according to a prescribed algorithm for each specific medication. Once again, we encounter the presence of extensive yet already established technical knowledge. We have the results, but the process behind their acquisition remains a mystery. What steps were taken? What errors were made along the way? Technical knowledge like this doesn't just emerge out of nowhere it speaks to a wealth of medical experience. If it was a trial and error process, someone must have been the first to go through it. Considering that we lack evidence that all these methods were discovered by Babylonian Ashu, 
there is a strong likelihood that at least some part of the recipes and the techniques for their preparation were inherited from a more ancient source. The challenge for future research will be to analyze the rationality behind the preparation methods. It is highly likely that things are not as straightforward as they may initially seem. Despite such an impressive arsenal of medicinal remedies, the main goal of administering medicine in ancient Babylon was to alleviate the pain and suffering of the patient. In other words, it did not necessarily aim for the complete cure of the patient's illness. It seems that Babylonians believed that only the gods through the Mashmashu exorcist could grant complete healing, while the task of the Ashu therapist was to alleviate pain. Behind this approach of symptomatic treatment, there may have been a philosophical system that did not entail the doctor's battle against death, unlike the mindset of modern physicians. It wasn't a lack of capability to cure, but rather a different perspective in relation to mortality. There is another aspect to consider. For example, in the Bible in the Old Testament, one can find a condemning attitude of the God Yahweh towards a person who relied on the knowledge of a physician and illness rather than the mercy of their God. This essentially reflects a negative view towards the role of the physician, which apparently at times took on radical forms. The difference between the Ashu therapist and the Mashmashu exorcist was not only in the services they provided. They relied on different medical sources. For the exorcists, it was the Diagnostic Handbook, a collection of symptoms and descriptions of diseases with prognoses. The Ashu therapists, on the other hand, relied on medical texts that not only described the same symptoms and diseases, but also provided methods for their treatment. It was previously believed that these list of symptoms should have matched. However, after some scholars conducted a comparative analysis of the entire medical corpus, they were surprised to find that there were only a few parallels. In most cases, a different language style was used to describe the symptoms in the diagnostic handbook of the exorcists, which differed from the descriptions of the same diseases and symptoms in the therapeutic texts. Now, this may suggest that the original medical texts of the Ashu therapists were simply used to create texts for the exorcists in a later period of history. And the fundamental difference is not only in the language, for example, in most therapeutic texts used by Ashu therapists, there was mention of the condition under which it should be used, specific instructions were given, and usually after that, the expected result of the application was stated. For example, the patient will improve. Such conclusions in Ashu texts are always positive. This is the crucial difference from the diagnostic handbook of the exorcists, Mashmashu. Their handbook contains long lists of the same symptoms related to different organs, as well as various omens of the exorcists. And in the overwhelming majority of cases, the result was supposed to be the death of the patient or the continuation of the disease, followed by the patient's death. Such differences in language, vocabulary, and fundamental psychological structure of medical texts could not have arisen out of nowhere and without reason. Could it be because Ashu therapists and Mashmashu exorcists had different patron gods? For the exorcists, it was Marduk. In the times of ancient Sumer, he was a secondary deity in importance, but later rose in the pantheon to become the supreme god of Babylon, absorbing the cults of other gods. For the Ashu therapists, it was the goddess Gula. This goddess had been revered since the times of ancient Sumer, and she was believed to be the one who breathed life back into humanity after the cataclysm of the Great Flood. Comparing ancient legends and myths, it becomes evident that not all gods were proponents of spreading knowledge among humans, and not all of them were benevolent towards humanity. This may have played a role in the stark difference found in the texts of the ancient Babylonian healers. In fact, the primary diagnostic and therapeutic task of the Mashmashu exorcists was to determine whether the illness was caused by a hand of a ghost or to precisely identify which deity had afflicted the patient. On the other hand, the Babylonian Ashu therapist resembled our modern-day pharmacist and physician, preparing complex prescriptions and remedies. As a secular individual, they did not have access to the temple's finances and typically worked on a street corner or directly from their own homes. If the Mashmashu exorcist understood the cause of illnesses to lie in the realm of fate or faith, the Ashu therapist focused more on the natural causes of symptoms. 
For example, causes such as insect bites, exposure to cold, sensitivity to sunlight, kidney stones, and other similar factors. Unfortunately, these ideas did not receive further development in Babylon. However, it turns out that not everything was straightforward with Babylonian magicians. Even the exorcists had different branches and subdivided into subcategories. In the Akkadian language, there were two terms for exorcists, ashipu and mashmashu. In Sumerian, there were many more. Interestingly, the term mashmashu derives from the root meaning to wipe. According to the hypothesis of Professor Geller, this word comes from an ancient Sumerian word that meant physiotherapist. And only later, much later, did the term mashmashu come to be associated with exorcism. I think that the word might have something to do with massage. That it may have something to do with a therapist who's assigned a physical therapist, because that probably was a very early form of therapy, of healing. But the odd thing is, and we don't know why, this word became associated with exorcism and magical incantations, not with um, actual use of whether pharmacology, where you actually are treating patient with drugs. Huh? So we don't know why the terminology divides in this way. It's logical to assume that in ancient times, the functions of mashmashu were different. They seem to have no connection to magical rituals. Among the exorcists, by the way, there were also those called shimu. The literal translation means plant grower, or in modern times, simply an herbalist. This fact may also explain why Babylonian exorcists, alongside their magical rituals, utilized the traditional pharmacopoeia of ashu therapists. That's because they shared common roots, a fact that confuses modern researchers. So, from kneading muscles to banishing demons. At first glance, ancient Babylonian recipes may appear fairly straightforward to study. However, in reality, their exploration is quite a challenging task. It remains an unsolved puzzle, despite the attempts of several generations of researchers to understand the terminology used by ancient physicians and pharmacists. The issue lies not only in our lack of knowledge about all the ancient herbs mentioned in the pharmacopoeia of that region, but also in the fact that many recipes were intentionally encoded by the ancient healers. The idea was likely to prevent ordinary individuals from easily using the ready-made recipes or impersonating a physician. This safeguard would apply equally to other doctors or exorcists. As a result, many familiar ingredients were replaced with a kind of filth pharmacy, consisting of feces, blood, and urine. It is precisely this filth pharmacy that confuses researchers the most, leading them to perceive ancient Babylonian medicine as primitive. However, rational scientific knowledge exists even in this context. Vekopatiki is a very important concept. You have recipes which have really very unpleasant ingredients, like bird droppings, or uh, all kinds of uh, animal, uh, animal extracts, huh? so uh, excrement and urine and, and saliva, anything that's going to come from these, and also from exotic animals and strange animals. And these, we would normally say, this, this is really disgusting. How could they possibly use this in the recipes? It now turns out, we now, a new picture emerges where we see they weren't using these disgusting ingredients in their recipes. These ingredients were secret names for quite ordinary plants and drugs. For example, a certain plant called Nikiptu, widely used for fumigation and preparing balms, was listed in this filth pharmacy as dog feces, dog tongue, or dog bone. Perhaps these were not merely abstract fake names. It's entirely possible that these epithets characterized certain distinctive features of the unidentified plant, such as its strength, unpleasant smell, juiciness, or hardness. Thus, it could serve not only as a cipher, but also as a kind of a hint for a knowledgeable physician. This can be seen in the case of another encrypted plant, the tamarisk. In the filth pharmacy, tamarisk was designated as lion's blood, which is not merely abstract, but hints at the sap from the middle part of the tamarisk plant. The phrase lion's blood itself suggests that it is a potent medicine. Another encrypted component, Rutitu in Akkadian, 
is a mineral that the Sumerian logogram literally translates as river foam. This naturally leads to the question, were these unconventional ingredients actually used in the physician's prescriptions? It appears that if these recipes were replicated with these counterfeit components, it was likely done by individuals lacking the necessary knowledge and understanding. And the idea was that the layman, the non-specialist, the non-professional, if he tried to make these recipes, it's not going to be, it's not going to work and it's going to be extremely unpleasant for the, for the patient. Because actually, these are all just secret names for very ordinary plants. And they probably didn't use these disgusting ingredients at all, right? So, but what happens in the course of time, these secrets were forgotten. So by the time we get to the Middle Ages, we find this Drekapoteke, these disgusting ingredients being used in recipes because the whole system had been lost. It may seem paradoxical, but the further you delve into the history of Babylonian medicine, the more distinct the separation between exorcism and healing becomes. So I think it's, it's true that if you just look at the written record, further back you go, you have many more magical texts and they begin earlier than medical texts, and there are many of them, and, there's, and there are relatively few medical texts in the earlier periods. That's absolutely true. But I think that's a little bit misleading, because I think that uh, much of these uh, medical recipes were probably learned by heart, and taught from one practitioner to another. You can't always tell by the written record what's happening, because we don't have any access to uh, other things. And the reason I think this is because if you look at some standard works like the famous law code of Hammurabi, the, there are special rules governing the physician and the treatment that a physician can offer someone, say treating the eyes or treating wounds or whatever. Now, there's no mention of the, of the exorcist in the code of Hammurabi. I think if the exorcist was just was an important healer like the doctor, then he ought to be mentioned as well. But it's very clear that it's only the doctor who's mentioned and not the exorcist. So I think there was already in earlier periods quite an established practice of medicine that's very different from magic. So texts that we have don't always give us a balanced view of what was really taking place. In the most ancient medical text known, inscribed on a Sumerian tablet from the city of Nippur almost 4,500 years ago, there is no mention whatsoever of magic, demons, or gods. That's what's interesting about this tablet. This is the first tablet we have, which is, it's not really medical. It's more like, uh, it, it's considered to be the first medical tablet, but it's not really, it's really a, a list of instructions of how to use drugs what kind of circumstances drugs would use. Normal medical tablet would say, if a person is sick with some kind of disease, say paralysis or fever, give him this and this and this and he'll get better. That's not what's on there. These are just really listing the various drugs. But there no ma- there's no magic here. There are no incantations. So even this kind of early sort of instructions using of plants was distinctive and different from magic. Prior to Samuel Kramer, It was believed that it was another text dedicated to occult rituals. However, he discovered that there was nothing remotely related to magic in it. Instead, he found a list of 15 well-preserved medical instructions, and all the terms referred to components of medicinal preparations. It seems that over time, there was not a linear development, but rather a clear degradation of medical knowledge. What was once a medical text and instruction was often transformed into a magical ritual. This was done clearly because the original medical knowledge was gradually being lost. For instance, consider the following excerpt. It's ritual. Crush together imher limb, myrrh, ostrich eggshell, black frit for three days in fish brine, for three days in drawn wine, and for three days in pomegranate juice. He keeps drinking it and he will improve. The original text of this prescription was also discovered on an Assyrian medicinal tablet. Surprisingly, this recipe-turned ritual was sourced from the library of Nineveh. 
What makes this particular recipe intriguing is the introductory phrase, it's ritual, typically used by exorcists as a preamble to magical incantations. It is evident that a compilation has taken place. Thus, what was originally a medicinal recipe on the Assyrian tablet has been transformed into a ritual and incantation on the tablet from Nineveh. This fact also indicates that the information from the medical texts of Ashu were compiled by spellcasters for their own purposes and used not according to its original intent. There are other examples to support this notion. In general, compilation of text blocks from various tablets was characteristic of exorcists. It was a kind of remix of recipes and rituals. Quotations were transformed into inserts and copied into numerous new ritual incantations, often with variations. Frequently, the same line with the text was copied across different tablets and within different medical contexts. However, the medical texts of Ashu took a different approach. Firstly, they were more intricate compared to other recipes. For instance, Ashu's recipes for treating eye ailments were faithfully and precisely copied from one tablet to another, with the entire block or text carefully preserved. Here, an intriguing discovery unfolded. Upon analyzing the nature of these textual insertions in the recipes, it became evident that the pharmacological information, encompassing both the list of medicinal herbs and the medical prescriptions, was derived from a common source. This is an extremely important finding. The origins of Babylonians' knowledge about plants, minerals, and the associated technical details of their processing remain unknown to us. We lack information on how this knowledge was obtained in the first place. There are no records of a gradual trial and error process in the proto-science of ancient Babylonian medicine, as we find in fields such as ancient Greek medicine. Instead, it seems that this knowledge appeared abruptly and fully developed, and the presence of a shared ancient source provides a plausible explanation for this phenomenon. If there was a path of trial and error, it must have been someone who followed it, accumulating the necessary medical experience. The ancient Babylonian physicians, in their turn, might be the ones who used this legacy. In some medical recipes, there is a fascinating occurrence of attributing knowledge to a legacy, found in an unusual colophon on a tablet dedicated to fever in the brain. The colophon reads, Proven and tested salves and poultices, fit for use, from the mouth of ancient antediluvian sages from Shurupak, which Enil Mubalit, sage, Apkalu of Nippur, left to posterity in the second year of Enil Bani, king of Isin. This particular colophon goes further in stating that experience gathered over a very long period of time from ancient experts to contemporary physicians makes these poultices tried and true. Could this reference merely be an attempt to lend authority or recount an extraordinary event from ancient times? The mentioned Apkalu believed to be seven wise beings, sages, who existed both before and after the flood, responsible for imparting the knowledge of civilization to humanity. Now, they should not be confused with the Anunnaki. According to legends, these beings were not human, but rather entities capable of taking on human form when necessary or desired. A fascinating version of this story is recounted by Barassus, a priest of Bel Marduk. According to his account, one of the Apkalu, named Oannes, would emerge from the sea every morning to teach people about agriculture, astronomy, and sciences, including the art of medicine. He guided them in building houses, establishing temples, formulating laws, and imparting the principles of geometry. Oannes' instructions were so comprehensive that no extra material has been added by way of improvement. When the day ended, he would return to the sea, refraining from eating or drinking while on land. His appearance was quite extraordinary, adorned in a fish-like outfit with scales, a fish-like head covering, and walking on two feet. Over time, other Apkalu followed Oannes, interacting with humans and maintaining contact at least until the time of the flood. These beings were of a distinct order from humans, normally invisible, but able to assume human form to engage with them. Depictions of the Apkalu often show human bodies with bird-like heads, reminiscent of Egyptian illustrations of Thoth, Horus, and others. Mesopotamian bas-reliefs portrayed them as griffin-like creatures with four wings and bird heads. It was believed that they served as intermediary forces, a council of sorts, responsible for earthly affairs. 
Known as Apkalu in Babylon, Abgal in Sumer, Jenny in Chaldea, and Beni Elohim among the Semites. These elements, drawn from various Sumerian and Babylonian sources, prefigure the sanitized version of the Nephilims as depicted in the Bible. In general, these legends can be interpreted as a non-human intelligence contact with humans at some point in prehistory. But regardless of interpretation, these stories undeniably support the notion of a common source of ancient knowledge in the region's mythology. And there is nothing extraordinary about such speculation, considering that even the civilizations of the ancient Near East were unknown to modern science until the late 19th century. The facts indicate the existence of such an experienced civilization. Although its heirs were unable to preserve and advance the acquired knowledge in the field of medicine, despite their best efforts. The exact reasons behind such a loss of knowledge are difficult to determine at present. Was it due to divine discord or the envy of the temple elite towards Babylonian therapists? One thing is certain, the subsequent generations of Babylonian healers were no longer capable of deciphering the secrets of the Ashu therapists and began concocting medicines using substituted ingredients from the filth pharmacy. They transformed ordinary medical recipes into their own magical incantations. The consequences soon became evident. By the 8th century BCE, the entire Babylonian medical system, without the Ashu therapist, had crumbled and lost its prestige across the region. Babylonian physicians were even excluded from foreign courts, their expertise disregarded. Ancient Babylonian medicine gives us the best, most complete, and fullest view of ancient medicine before the developments of Greek medicine. But the Babylonian medical material is really entirely new. That is, that these are tablets which were excavated in the 19th century, and they have been in the British Museum, and in the Berlin Museum, and to a certain extent in the Lumbra, in the Istanbul Museum, and most of these have never been translated. The majority still remain untranslated and not really adequately studied. And this medicine, ancient Babylonian medicine, will really give us a much better insight into medicine before the Greeks. Of course, we also have Egyptian medicine, which has been studied because the papyri have been known for a long time, but Babylonian medicine is more complete. It extends over much longer period. Ancient Babylon inherited true medical knowledge, possibly passed down from an even older and more experienced civilization. However, this fact was not fully recognized in ancient Babylon itself. The knowledge of the Ashu physicians was lost over time, leaving many of their enigmas unresolved to this day. Yet the modern term physician in the Mesopotamian region derives from the term Ashu, rather than the term mashmashu used for exorcists. What other new findings are on the horizon? Aside from the fact that we are translating this, this enormous amount of material and uh, collecting all the names of the various drugs and trying to re-establish the system of diagnosis, but the, one of the main uh, differences in how we work and what's happened in the past is, is that we are concentrating on this aspect of what, what one calls secular knowledge. So the assumption is this, that once the astronomers were able to understand that the, they could predict the movements of the stars very, very accurately, once they were able to do this called into question the entire supposition of who controls the cosmos who controls the world. Because before these advances in astronomy, the idea was, well, the gods made the decisions. It was a personal decision of the gods. They had a plan of the heavens. They decided which stars go where. And with this new system of astronomy, it was understood that there was, a, there was an, an idea of natural law, that the cosmos functions according to its own natural law. And the idea is we have to understand these laws. And once this, these discoveries were made in astronomy, this had a huge impact on thinking in every other science, including medicine. 
that if you can predict the stars, maybe you can also predict the course of disease much more accurately. And there were attempts to combine astrology and astronomy with, with medical predictions and with diagnosis and also with magic. It's when is the best time, when is the best time of the day, when is the best time of the year, when is the best month to, to uh, use such magical rituals. So they're trying to systematize things. They're trying to make them more uh, scientific, if you want to call it that, according to established rules of how the cosmos operates and how it works. So the role of the gods in this way becomes somewhat more diminished, that, you're, that there are other factors that are at play, not just whether the gods are angry with you. May not, that may be irrelevant to what you're sick. So the patient all over has to feel guilty for being sick. Huh? And the gods may not be, it, it may, it, it, of course it helps to pray to the gods because the gods are ultimately in control of everything. This is a system divide, designed by the gods, but the system is able to function according to its own rules. And these are the important changes that we begin to see. And it's happening in Mesopotamia, the same time it's happening in Greece with the these new developments and philosophy and thinking about how the world operates and what are the basic elements of the of the universe. This same kind of thinking is really uh, going on uh, more or less of this everywhere, even as far as China. And this is what's interesting to us. It's intriguing to consider what new information and discoveries could be found within the ancient common source that potentially forms the foundation of all Babylonian medical texts. This source remains to be discovered and investigated, and it appears that it holds the answers to numerous mysteries and insights into the ancient world's medicine.